for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your kindness. We thank you, Lord, for your joy. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for your Thanks, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever and ever. For his mercy endureth forever and ever. For his mercy endureth forever and ever. Unto the of the sun, going down the stand. You know the name of the Lord. It is worthy to be praised. I'm the rising of the sun, going down on the same. You know the name of the Lord. It is worthy to be praised for His mercy. together and give God praise in the building. Go Jesus, go Jesus, go. Say go Jesus, go Jesus, go. Say go Jesus, go Jesus, go. When I say Jesus, you say Christ Jesus. Jesus, when I say Jesus, you say Christ, Jesus, Jesus, go Jesus, go Jesus, go. Come on now, go Jesus, go Jesus, go. Praise the Lord. When I say Jesus, you say. Amen, amen, amen. This morning, Pastoral Reflections focuses on our church school. How many of you know how important church school is? Sunday school, studying God's word, God's holy word, amen. And so next Sunday at 8.30, the church school will be coming together in unity and we will be celebrating the Lord. We will be celebrating the Lord. Adults and children and all that we've learned in the last quarter, we will be coming together in unity. And we invite the entire church body to join us at 8.30. Some of you have been invited, your children have been invited to participate in the program. We look forward to seeing every single person under the sound of my voice, either in this sanctuary or on the internet. We invite you all to be with us 8.30 for the church uh, school next Sunday. See you all there. Our leadership will now come.
to reach out to man to show him your love and your perfect plan you gave me my ears now i can hear your voice so clear i can hear the cry of sinners but can I wipe away their tears? Lord, you gave me my voice to speak your word, to sing all your praises to those who never heard. But with my eyes I see the need for more availability. I've seen hearts that have been broken, so many people to be free. Lord, I'm available to you. My will I give to you. I'll do what you say. Do use me, Lord, to show someone the way and then enable me to say my storage is empty. And I am available to you. Lord, now I'm giving back to you all of the tools you gave to me. My hands, my ears, my voice, my eyes, so you can use them as you please. Lord, I have emptied out my cup so that you can fill it up. Now I'm free and I want to be more available to you. I'm available to you. My will I give to you. I'll do what you say do. Use me, Lord, to show someone the way. Then enable me to say, my storage is empty, and I am available to you. Oh, Lord, Lord, I'm available to you, to you. say do use me Lord to show someone the way and enable me to say my storage is empty and I am available to you Help me, Lord, and I am available to you, 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 you. My storage is empty, and I am available to you, to you.
Let us say amen. amen. Let us say amen one more time. Amen. My storage is available. My storage is empty. You may not realize it, but your storage is empty. But we have to come to a realization of being available. I want now, as a, another supplement to the reading of <clears throat> Matthew's narrative on this, to ask you, if you will, to look at John's narrative found in 6, St. John 6. I trust that during your Lenten season you're going to read this another perspective on this same account. Uh, verse 5 says, When Jesus then lift up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, there is a lad here which have five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? I want to talk to you today from Lenten lessons. Lenten lessons. Shall we bow, shall we pray? Consecrate me now unto thy service, Lord, to the power of thy grace divine. Let our soul look up with a steadfast hope that I will be lost in thine. Amen. Help me now. Will you say to someone next to you, Lenten lessons? We are in the season of Lent, and so we want to reflect upon how we need to be preparing ourselves for the celebration of Jesus' resurrection. Now, this account in the gospel reading comes to us so that we may analyze Jesus' movements and get a better understanding of Jesus, how he interacts. Because I hope during this season you are spending time really trying to figure out how can we be more like Jesus. If you're coming just to be a member of the church, you're coming because you like I worship but my style of preaching, you're wasting your time. But the real question ought to be, how can I become a better disciple? How can I get power for living? That I may live this life victoriously. And so, as we look at this story of Jesus, the gospel story, in the account is that you need to know this is one of Jesus' last miracles. And it comes in two accounts of the Gospels showing the disillusionment of John the baptizer. Let me pause by saying to you this morning that if you've been in faith, and you've not been disillusioned, you've not been in this faith very long. The text, the, the, the fact of the matter is, 
you'll never know what God is up to. I've been searching, I've been reading this Bible almost as long as I can remember and even though it is the blueprint on how to live victoriously, God does not tell us everything. Can I get a witness? And so the text begins by saying John the baptizer, he who scripture says is the cousin of Jesus, he who leaped in his mother's womb hearing that Jesus had been conceived, he who said, this is he who I'm not even worthy to unlatch his shoes. This is he that when he baptized Jesus, scripture says heaven opened up and said that the spirit descended like a dove and God spoke and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Can you imagine something like that happening? But now, you know, life got a funny way of making you think differently when you're in another place. I hope it won't be hard preaching today. He then was in the water looking at the daffodils and listening to the sonorous sound of the water run and hearing the birds sing, but now he's in jail because if you are ever going to be faithful to God, you're going to find yourself in a jail situation. One account says that uh, Herod, his lustful self, wanted his niece and he had already taken his brother's wife and they had conspired to ask for John the, uh, uh, the baptizer's head because he dared preach the gospel. And, and, and when he I told her, I'd give anything you do when you do that uchi coochie dance for me. She asked for John's head. And so John is in jail knowing he's going to die. And with all he had witnessed, all he had lived through all he had gone through, all that he had heard God say, he's in jail, and he asked his disciples, go ask Jesus, does he know? I'm struggling. Go ask him, does, is he the one? Or should we look for another? Help me, Holy Ghost. And in life, sometimes life has a way of beating you up. Have life ever given you a black eye? Have you ever been bowed over because life has given you an uppercut? Have you ever been leaned over because life done hit you in your kitten and you had to go to work anyway? He was in that situation, and John must have thought, like many of us think, that God, because we're so close to him, we go to church, at least most Sundays, and he thought the Lord was going to give him a hookup. I felt like that sometimes. Go see if Jesus know I am in trouble. And the Bible says that Jesus took the disciples around healed the sick, fed the hungry, gave sight to the blind. He didn't say nothing. He just said, go tell John that that you've seen and heard. And so I want to kind of start with that because we, like John, sometimes have doubts. We have dilemmas. Sometimes our faith is under assault. We live with a certain level of uncertainty in our lives. And when you are facing terrible, torturous situations, when your life is in a place of volatility and you are dealing with the turbulence in your life that all of us have to deal with, confronting stormy conditions, you don't feel like singing Blessed Assurance. That's nice on Sunday, isn't it? 
But I dare you to be trying to sing that with a shut-off notice in front of you. <laughs> that we too, like John, began to ask, Jesus, are you the one? Yeah. Or should we look for another? And so there's Lenten lessons that we want to talk about facing a recession in a society that is increasingly becoming more inequitable. The rich are really rich, the poor are really poor. Islam is growing, church attendance is falling. Traditional faith is somewhere between a $60 million jet and storefront churches. Church has to let out because empire is on. Hard to fast when scandal still is in season. That we really have to ask, Lord, are you the one? Union jobs are shrinking and job security is gone. Union states are becoming right to work states. And pensions are not guaranteed and social security is not secure. So we have to ask, Lord, are you the one? Or should we look for another? And so I want to zero in on this lesson. I want to zero in on this exchange because you, like me, face what I believe are the contrasts of our faith and our expectations and our norms and what God does. You know, there's a passage of scripture that says, God's ways are not our ways. And so, I don't know about you, but I've come to find out God always seems to slip me a little mickey. I'm trying to figure out how God's going to do something. I'm trying to expect how God is going to do something, but I realize the more I read my Bible, the more I try to plot out what God is going to do, that God doesn't work according to my plan or my mindset. If you don't leave with nothing else, understand God is not controlled by you. And guess what? God is sovereign. God can do what God wants to do when God gets ready to do. And guess what? You better just deal with it. You sitting around, I ain't going to church. I'm mad at God. Guess what? God ain't studying you. I'm going to keep my money at home. God know how to get that money out your pocket at home. You ain't that slick. God can catch you where you are, and God will get your attention wherever you go. Ask Jonah. Because whenever you leave God, you're going to find yourself in hell. And the moment you decide not to be obedient to God, you're already going down. So, so uh, Mark's account of this story says that Jesus ain't like us. First lesson we understand is that Jesus ain't cliquish, Jesus is not elitist, and Jesus ain't trying to impress nobody. He don't waste no time trying to get name brand nothing. It says that Jesus had a group around him that were in need. Mark 6, 3.33 says, he looked at them and he realized their loss and they were helpless. They were vulnerable people. And we already know that Jesus always was comfortable around people that most of us are not comfortable around. The Samaritans, the zealots, the tax collectors, and poor people. Let me say that one more time. You know, the Lord loves poor people. Congress doesn't. 
Obama may not even like them. But God loves poor people. God is concerned about people that don't have a seed offering. God loves those that society has marginalized. God preached and healed and taught. And the Bible says that they were getting so much from Jesus that they anticipated where he was going. Because they heard, they saw something in him they were not getting from most places. So Matthew picks it up and he says that when Jesus got through preaching, text says he had compassion. I can pause right there. Good God of he saw their condition. He saw their situation. He saw how they lived and he could surmise how their lifestyles were. And the text says he had compassion. The Greek says that he had a feeling that came deep from his bowels for them because he was emotionally attached to their situation. I wonder this morning, the first lesson to us, out of this Lenten lesson, how many of us care about other people's conditions? How many of us care about other people's circumstances, other people's challenges, move Jesus to such a point? Uh, too many of us. Our mindsets only allow us to think about me, my, and I. I wonder this morning, do you care about poor people? And I'm not just talking about poor black folk. Do you care about poor people throughout the world? When you're throwing food away and taking out your rubbish, do you realize that there are many people in the world who've never had a full stomach? When you look at how many pairs of sneakers and coats and jackets have, look at the clothes you can't fit no more. Do you realize there are people who've never had a pair of shoes on their feet? Jesus was moved by compassion. But now there's something else that we need to see is that we need to also see ourselves. That after Jesus had been preaching, Jesus had been teaching, Jesus cared about the people. And then the text shows us the contrast of that. It says that when Jesus said, listen, it's evening and these people need something to eat. And John says Jesus now is testing his disciples. For he already knew what he was going to do. You know, my father says that all of us are like tea bags and we really don't find out what's in us until we get in hot water. And I've come to find out that God allows us to get in hot water from time to time because he wants us to know what's really in us. Look at the disciples. They are two things. First, they are insensitive. Jesus said they're hungry. Jesus says they need to eat. Jesus said they don't have anything. And the disciples say, send them away. Let that sink in for a minute. I began to think about that over this week and I began to realize that other folk problems don't bother us. We know how to blame folk for their problems because we don't want to deal with them and we will quickly find ways to exclude folk that we don't want included anyway and we'll find all kind of ways to say send them a way. You're looking at me real strange, but I dare if I came in here with a bunch of openly gay people and transvestite, you'll say, Reverend, send them away. You may say, won't you go with them? I'm telling you, children.
children I brought them in folks said you can't fill this church up with kids they ain't got no money send them away I brought in Spanish people I brought in ex-cons I brought in teenage mothers I brought in people from the projects if I brought in drug dealers if I brought in people who are HIV positive you would somebody may say send them away let them go down the street We can't have that many ex-cons in here. We can't have that many teenage mothers in here. We can't have that many young women with hips and short skirts in here. We can't have folk in here that don't fit our description of who we want in God's house. I'm going to pause. You are getting quiet in me, but let me tell you this morning, this is God's house. And I don't care who they are, where they're from, how they look. These are God's folks. They come in with turbans, let them come. They come in poor, let them come. They come on drugs, let them come. If they come white, rich, let them come. If they come Islamic, let them come. Whoever wants to come and worship God, they got a right to worship God in God's house. I don't care how they dress. I don't care what their sexuality is. I don't care how many tattoos they have. They're God's children, and they have a right to worship God in God's house. I said, send them away. We, we, we don't ever want to send away folk who we think can give us something. Well. <laughs> Donald Trump coming here, you ain't going to say send him away. <laughs> Oprah coming here, you ain't going to say send her away. Folk be skinning and grinning. But then not only are we insensitive, and I'm hoping that some of the men will join me Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday as I look around and stand around the library and just see our young children just looking, just wanting somebody to pay them some attention. But not only are we insensitive, but we are cynical we're selfish and I've come to find out that if I'm not careful with myself we, 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 we figure out elaborate ways of being negative see the telephone is good for those on top but it's a horrible thing for those on the bottom uh, because what it does is it allows us to get our negative story to folk who don't know no better. Y'all yeah. didn't hear what I just said, did you? Yes, yes. Uh, 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 they tell me Empire has millions of people watching foolishness through the medium of TV. Uh, Y'all didn't hear what I just said today. If I asked and had a little phone line trying to get somebody to get a positive message out, I start off by saying, God bless you, and I bet it would come back, God F you. Can I pause and tell you, you better be careful watching that news first thing in the morning because the first thing you don't do, you don't need to see first thing in the morning who got shot, who been robbed. Before you cut on the TV, before you listen to the radio, you need to be able to get down on your knees and say, Lord, thank you for waking me up this month. Thank you that I have food on my table. Thank you for putting a roof over my head. So not, not, only, not only are they insensitive, but they're cynical, they're selfish, they're dismissive, and they say, listen, we don't have any means of helping them. Jesus asked Philip, he knew they were from that area. 
he says, he already knew what he was going to do. Now, they had already seen Jesus heal. They had already seen Jesus feed 4,000 people. Keep that in mind. But there's something about negativity that has a longer life than positivity. They said to Jesus, not only can't we feed them, but there's no place around here that can feed them. In other words, there's no Walmart around here. Ain't nobody got no Sam's Club car. We don't know how many turkeys we'll have to cook to feed these hungry folk because we don't want to feed them anyway. And, and, and then they go even deeper than that. Listen, they say, you would need, look, look how elaborate we are in thinking the wrong way. You would need 200 denarians. You would need eight months wages. Can you imagine what we would be able to do if we quit being so negative and start thinking more positively and having more faith in God? They're telling the creator of the universe. They're telling the one who called light into existence. They're telling the one who made water clear, who made milk white, cows brown. They're telling the one who made clouds white and the sky blue what he can't do. Some of you sitting here already, you, your, your faith so low that you almost don't even know why you come to church because you don't already made up your mind what God can't do. You done written folk off. You done said folk ain't going to be nothing. They'll never amount to anything. But I stopped to tell you this morning, I serve a God. He sits high and he looks low and he's able to do any and everything but fail. Can I find a witness? I said I'm looking for a witness this morning. There anybody here how the Lord ever healed your body? There anybody here the Lord ever turned you around? There anybody here didn't know how you were going to make it and God made a way out of that? There anybody here? I don't come here to say what God can't do. I come to celebrate what God will do. There is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do the same thing for you. They're insensitive. Send them away. And then they are cynical and selfish. And they're telling the Lord, we need eight months wages to feed them and I want you to know today that don't you ever forget God got all power in his hands don't you ever forget that God can't fix it for you don't you ever forget that God doesn't have the ability to change what you can't change don't you forget God can fix what you don't want to fix. Don't you ever forget that God got all power in his hands. And if you have enough faith in God, if you put your faith in God, somebody said God never fails. He abides with me. He gives me victory. God never fails. Just keep the faith. Never cease to pray. God never fails. So now listen to what he does. This, 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 what the, he already knew what he's going to do. So he sends them. They think they're doing something. They surveying, but he doesn't want them to survey because we don't know how to survey no way. <laughs> they don't told him why he can't do it. So listen to what he says. He says, "What do you have?" Right. See, when you're coming out of a deficit in your mentality, you're going to end up with a deficit. But when you look at what you have, that sounds like what God told Moses. Moses, what is in your hand? And see, I guarantee you, you don't need a new Easter suit if you look in your closet. 
What do you have? You don't need to go to Red Lobster after church. You got enough uh, 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 frozen chicken, beef. Already in the yeah. see, we don't need. I don't mean no harm. You may not like it. We don't need grants and all that government money. All we need to do is tell people quit going to the sugar house and bring some of that money to God's house. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. What do you have in your hand? If we start looking at what we already have in our community and see the gifts and the graces that God has already bestowed on us. What, 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 what do you have? Now it says, after he asked them for that, it says he prayed over it. Yeah. Yeah. I need to tell you today, rather than always being so filled with ingratitude, start thanking God yeah. for what you already have. Yeah. Can I pause right there? Quit being, quit always talking about what you don't have, what you need, and what you want somebody to give you. Start thanking God. Thank you for this house. Thank you for this food. Thank you for these clothes. Thank you for life, health, and strength. Thank you for hands. Thank you for feet. Thank you for mind. Thank you for my problems. If I never had a problem, I wouldn't know God could solve them. Job may not pay you as much as you like. Thank you. Thank you for this job. I didn't have to have that. You may be sick, but you've got a reasonable portion of life, health, and strength. Thank God for that. Finally, this morning, I read St. John 6 for a reason because it says that he sent them to figure out what they had. See, we always spend too much time talking about what we don't have. And God wants us to start being thankful for what we have. And the text says that when they survey Paul's, 5,000 men, not including women and children, let's say if it's 5,000 men, it must be at least 8,000 women. The pill didn't come out till 1959, so it must be. <laughs> 20,000 people. But yet, he can only get two fish and five loaves. And now, let me even go even further than that. The translation of this is not right. He had two sardines. This wasn't no tuna or whiting. Two sardines. And you see, five loaves of bread does not wonder. He had five biscuits. And the text says they're not even wheat, they're barley. This is a boy. I got two points and I'm finished. Now, you know 20,000 folks. I could eat all week if I just win some of these women's purse. I eat, live off crackers and mints all week. I may even be able to get me a little nip. But they had become so tight-fisted, so selfish, so self-absorbed, that nobody wanted to give anything to help anybody else. I'm going to say that one more time. They had become so tight-fisted, so selfish, so self-absorbed that no one was willing to give anything to help anybody else. 
are closing when I tell you. The text said it was a little boy who had not learned how to be so selfish yet. Oh, praise God's name. Somebody who had not been intimidated by bills and problems and situation. And I want you to know this morning that it's not what you have. It's what you're willing to give. I'm closing when I tell you the boy didn't have much. But the boy represented a starting point for Jesus. And that is my prayer this morning that I just want to be a starting point for Jesus. I don't have much and I may not have much to offer. What I have may not be noble. It may not be sophisticated, but whatever I have, whatever I have, I'm willing to give it to Jesus and let Jesus do whatever Jesus wants to do with it. It says he prayed over it and he broke it and he gave it away. Oh, bless God's holy name. I want you to know, my brothers and my sisters, whatever I have, I'm willing to give it. And I hope whatever you have, we are willing to give it to God. You don't have to have much, but you ought to be willing to help somebody. You may not be a preacher. You may not be able to preach like Paul. You may not be able to pray like Silas, but you can help somebody. Somebody on your block, somebody in your school, somebody in your apartment building need what you have. And you ought to be willing to share it with somebody. Oh, I want you to know, 32 years ago today, I was nothing but a boy. But I had tears in my eyes when I walked up in front of Samaritan Baptist Church and I said, Lord, I yield. Whatever you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll do what you want me to do. I'm yours, Lord. Praise the Lord. Lenten lessons. Lenten lessons. Says the deacons come forward.